Okay. All right, fantastic. So everybody welcome again to, um, this is our week four and uh, today is uh, a fantastic seminar on MR safety. Um, there's been a, a bit of material you guys covered in your first, second week. Um, I think today we're gonna get a little bit more conceptual hands on uh, from Dr. Yves Levesque. Uh, Dr. Yves Levesque is a medical physicist uh, at McGill. He is um, a professor of uh, medical physics and also the Department of Oncology at McGill University and at McGill University Healthcare Center. Um, his uh, main focus is on um, MRI physics and acquisition, image reconstruction. He does a lot of work on magnetization transfer and relaxation mapping. App, MR applications in oncology, neuroimaging, and MSK, and also MR imaging methods for radiation oncology treatment planning. So I'm going to turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Levesque. Go right ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. I'm glad to see uh, a very nice turnout here and some interest in the MR safety session. Uh, thanks also for the kind introduction. Um, we're going to dig into safety from a cardiac MR perspective as fits with the rest of your program. I hope as we go along that there will be uh, questions and interaction. I haven't set up specifically the, the, the questions for any kind of response, so I'll, I'll ask you to, um, to use the meeting chat if you want to answer other than, uh, or you can also use uh, uh, live voice, uh, of course. So let's get into it. Uh, I have, I guess, a couple of disclosures. I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare, no any commercial interest with respect to this presentation. And any commercial products I'll mention today are really incidental. Um, I do use some copywritten images in the presentation. So uh, I, I feel it's fair to mention that I'm doing so under fair use for educational purposes. If you're going to reuse some of these slides, please consult the original sources uh, rather than reusing the images as they appear here. Most of the guidance I will present today is internationally recognized. I know that can mean different things in different places, but they largely uh, are recognized across, uh, across borders. But of course, most of the sources I rely on are of uh, North American and European origin. Uh, so if you apply any of the knowledge that you have today, make sure that uh, it complies with any policies or procedures or any local regulations or guidelines where you work and operate. So the presentation will have two broad learning objectives, and that matches sort of the first and second half of the uh, presentation. So at the end of the session, you should be able to describe the main risks associated with MR examination. And some of the mitigation approaches, I don't go very deeply into general MR safety today for time limitations, because I want to be able to get to objective two, which is to list issues that are more specific to cardiac MR, including you know, medical interventions around that and uh, device safety. So I, I'll start out with sort of my philosophy, which I think is reflected in this philosophy of many others who practice MR and that MR safety is ultimately a team effort and involves many people. We don't rely on individual, on single individuals to perform this work. So it's a team effort to enable safe exams in as many patients as possible. Um, there's an old approach to MR safety, which was to be conservative and to exclude people uh, on the basis of any devices or any conditions they may have from MR. And I really think there's been a shift in the MR safety culture to make it an enabling uh, pursuit rather than an exclusion type of pursuit. So if you keep this in mind in your MR practice, it'll make things uh, smoother. Of course, our goal in MR safety should be to avoid unsafe examination, so anything that may put the patient, uh, expose the patient to excess excessive risk. Um, and we want to balance that with um, the avoidance of misinformed or even inappropriate refusals for examination. So examination refusals that might be based on erroneous information. Of course, um, we have to know, therefore, where risk comes from when we hear of incident stories in MR. And of course, the biggest risk to patient safety, uh, when it is reported, when it is recorded, happens to be failure to follow guidelines or even uh, following or using outdated information. So it's important to uh, 
keep in mind that you need to uh, have clear guidelines and to make sure that your information is up to date. Very quickly now, because these basics may already be obvious to uh, most of you, if not all of you, but let's go through uh, to make sure that we are on the same footing. The safety risks inherent to MR examination come from a few different components in the MRI system, including uh, the presence of a large magnetic field from the main magnet, the use of radio frequency fields during active imaging. There is some slight or modest risk uh, related to the RF receive system. Uh, the gradient system itself also brings its um, load of risks. Um, and I mentioned here patient support, but this is not something we will talk about too, too much today. So the main magnet uh, you are, of course, familiar with. It operates in a range of a partial Tesla to a few Tesla uh, to generate the static magnetic field that is uh, relevant for imaging. Without this field, um, there is no imaging. So superconducting magnets, and in fact, also permanent magnets, we have to remember are always on and can't be easily turned off or at all. Um, electromagnets, which sit in between the two that are not superconducting, do have an easier time ramping up and down. The main magnet, of course, has its affiliated or associated risks. Uh, whatever field strength you operate at, this is a much stronger field than any other magnet you'll encounter in your everyday life. And that uh, results in a force that is active on ferromagnetic objects. I think this is pretty obvious stuff, even for uh, the lay public who have typically heard of at least one kind of story from somewhere where there are uh, objects pulled into magnets. Um, perhaps quite uh, relevant to today's discussion is the potential for disruption of active devices due to this magnetic field. Without belaboring the point, uh, the projectile effect is what pulls objects towards the center of the bore. Um, as you see in this example on the bottom right. And it's most uh, prominent or most active, if you want, at the entrances of the, uh, of the MRI system. If you have one of these double donut systems that has the field running vertically, the forces are strongest right near the openings of that bore as well. Carrying on, if I can, there we go. The second effect that is present in these magnetic fields, of course, is the torque effect. And this is um, when uh, ferromagnetic objects will turn once inside that magnetic field to align with the B field. The classic example, the, the classic warning around these is, is around uh, aneurysm clips, which you see pictured here uh, on this part of the slide. And so this happens largely at the center of the magnet or as you're entering into the magnet, uh, the effect is strongest at the center of the bore. And one of the fears, I suppose, or, or one of the uh, uh, greatest risks is for ferromagnetic implants that are in soft tissue that could reorient to the field. Some, if not many, uh, magnetic resonance imaging systems are equipped with a cryogenic cooling system. This is the presence of liquid helium. I won't belabor the point other than to mention that these cryogen systems have their associated risks and if you work on such a system, you should become familiar with them. The radio frequency transmit system uh, is what produces those RF field pulses used for imaging. They're frequent, they're short. These do not make any noise and they are there to generate the MR signal. Um, their amplitude is much smaller than the main field, but their effect, of course, is related to the possibility of heating. So the RF field is a magnetic field. It deposits energy in the body by producing electric fields inside the body. And so we end up with what we call a, a he or heating deposition or heat deposition, which is measured by SAR or the specific absorption rate. The specific absorption rate is measured in watts per kilogram. So it's an energy amount per unit time per unit mass, uh, so normalized to the size of the patient. Heating occurs on a regular basis. We get very mild heating during every exam. In the most extreme examples, the patient can get warm. 
And in examples where there are usually involved devices of some sort, this can lead to thermal injury, burns, uh, the higher potential, as I mentioned, is in the presence of MR unsafe devices. A second effect that happens in the presence of these RF fields is, again, the disruption of active devices. Uh, the receive system, of course, you uh, will be familiar with the fact that we have these receive coils that either are built into the MRI system or that we place on or around the patient during examination. This is essentially a passive system. From the perspective of an engineer, of an MR physicist, even from your own learning perspective, this is not quite true. This, there are actions taken by the receive system, but it doesn't produce any fields. And that's what I mean by a passive system or essentially passive system here. The best way to ensure that the RF receive system is not producing any MR safety risks is to ensure that they are free of damage, that they are well connected during the entire exam, and that they are functioning properly, that they are recognized by the software, and that they are checked on a regular basis. Because if this is misused, uh, it can result in equipment malfunction, which is a basic problem, or it can lead to excessive heating of the patient and even burns. Moving on now to the gradient field system. This is the loud part, as you probably already know. The gradient system is on during imaging only and is there to encode spatial information during the imaging process. It generates slightly larger magnetic fields that interact with the static magnetic field that is present at all times. And so that generates forces inside the MRI system and those forces make the gradient system vibrate. Those vibrations are intense enough and at the right frequencies that they are audible to the human ear, as you probably already know. In most MRI systems, these things are water-cooled and are fast switching. So they generate loud acoustic noises. We have to provide for hearing protection during MR examinations. And the other risk that arises here is that of peripheral nerve stimulation. So these two things affect the patient. We'll describe PNS in a moment. And at the risk of repeating myself, the gradient system also gives rise to potential disruption of active devices when exposed. A word on peripheral nerve stimulation. Uh, you may already be familiar with this, uh, but it is caused by gradient field switching. So these gradient fields oscillate also at a frequency, but they generate currents inside the, inside the body that can affect nerve function. And so nerves can be uh, brought about to, uh, to, to firing. And then, and then what can happen is that the patient will either experience uh, a sensation such as tingling, tapping, even a twitching sensation there, they can have slight mo movement. Uh, and extreme examples, uh, this can result in even patient discomfort and uh, pain at the sort of highest end. Um, Perhaps relevant to today's, uh, or, or very relevant to today's presentation, is to discuss the likelihood of cardiac stimulation from these gradient systems. This is extremely unlikely in clinical systems. The power used in gradient systems is kept well below any threshold that could result in uh, cardiac stimulation. How is peripheral nerve stimulation studied or characterized? You'll see on this graph here, um, there's a plot of the stimulus strength, so the intensity of the gradient uh, field that is used on the, oh, I apologize for that, on the y-axis of this plot and the duration of the stimulus along the x-axis. So short, low intensity gradient pulses lie in the no stimulation region, as do high intensity short pulses and as do longer intensity, uh, lower intensity long pulses. Any combination of high intensity, long duration gradient pulses are more likely to result in PNS, peripheral nerve stimulation. Now, of course, when you're sitting at the operator console, chances are that you will not be asked whether you want long or short gradient pulses or high intensity pulses. Usually what happens is that the scanner looks at the pulse sequence and will measure a likelihood 
of PNS. And if that likelihood is high, uh, it's usually expressed on a percent scale, then you'll get a warning. And that is based on uh, sort of experimental measurements of peripheral nerve stimulation in humans. Oh, um, it should be mentioned, I suppose, and I'll note it here, that peripheral nerve stimulation is not permanent. Patients will not walk away from the MRI system continuing to feel per peripheral nerve stimulation, so it is a temporary condition, and it's unusual. It's not usually observed. If we bring together some observations on RF in this portion of the table and gradient in this portion of the table, we can look at various limitations that can be imposed on the operation of an MRI system. And there's a uh, standardized approach to characterization of the performance, which relies on normal operation mode or first level controlled operation mode. I won't go into the exact numbers here. These can be consulted uh, in various sources and in uh, IEC documents, so international standards documents. And once you, uh, you, you'll receive a copy of these uh, slides, you can consult the numbers again. But what essentially this means is that we can operate a, a scanner uh, with essentially no expectation of physiological stress as long as we remain within the normal operating mode. If we move into first level controlled mode, there is a need for a risk benefit analysis here. It can be done on the spot by the operator. Um, and this implies a certain amount of medical supervision. And again, that medical supervision can be delegated to the MRI system operator. So the technologist radiographer can, uh, can take care of this. There is an entire area here called second level controlled mode in the, in the rightmost column. Most, if not all, MRI systems will lock out this mode. So ex exceeding these limitations is usually not possible. So we are about halfway through um, this content for today. Um, I think everything so far, if you're operating an MRI system, should have seemed relatively obvious to you, if not already ingrained knowledge. I'm happy to take to pause and take questions at this point on any uh, general concepts before we move into uh, the second portion of the presentation. So of course, MR comes with its inherent risks. Uh, those that are on at all times is largely the magnetic field is usually always on, uh, leading to the potential of uh, for projectile and torque effects. And then risks that are present during active imaging are those related to the RF fields and gradient fields. Now, if you are practicing in the MR field, of course, you should be familiar with these as well as prevention practices. And usually that relies on local policies and procedures, typically at the institutional level to guide how we should practice MR imaging in a safe uh, way for our patients. All right. So we'll carry on. So as a general observation, what are some considerations for safe MR examination? Well, it starts with a good foundation of preparation. It's an operational culture. There should be uh, good knowledge amongst the team and a good understanding of who's responsible for what aspects. Of course, there are then some technical considerations as well as some exam and patient-related considerations. So let's look at these with a bit of emphasis on cardiac magnetic resonance. So what are some ingredients for a culture of safe MR? You should sit here and sort of ask yourself, um, whether you practice these and whether your institution has a good practice in these areas and what you can do to help strengthen this and build teamwork around these areas. So special considerations, of course, around staffing, making sure that staffing is certified uh, and well-trained to perform their duties. That includes uh, technologists, radiographers, physicians, nurses, um, aides, people who, anybody involved in the, in the uh, provision of imaging care. 
making sure that these people have the right knowledge and the right training for MR safety. In the MR area, in the MR environment, there should be a clear chain of command. You should know who is in charge uh, and who can answer questions. There are uh, recommendations from the American College of Radiology that are generally agreed upon uh, in the area. Uh, I see there's a couple of questions that are, oh, there's a question that's come up, which we will deal with uh, in, in, uh, in a few minutes. Um, so there should be a clear chain of command. There's a good agreement uh, internationally over recommendations to have what are, what are called an M MR medical director in a facility, as well as an MR safety officer. So an MR medical director is typically a physician who oversees the MR operations and is responsible for establishing procedures, establishing policy, and making sort of last call decisions on any sort of uh, gray areas, whether it become whether it's related to a specific patient or exam or so or, or so on. The MR safety officer is typically a technologist radiographer, uh, someone who is practicing, is on the ground and is making sort of the, the minute by minute or hour by hour calls when it comes to MR safety. Uh, establishing pol policies and procedures is important and making sure that you have clear workflows, especially for complicated procedures, including uh, cardiac MRI in the presence of certain devices. Emergency preparedness is important, and this is underlined, I think, uh, in the cardiac MR uh, uh, realm. Every institution or every facility should have on hand, um, on hand and ready procedures to deal with emergencies, medical emergencies, and others such as fires, leaks, electrical outages, um, chemical spills, system malfunctions, even violent patients. So take the time to establish uh, ways to deal with these issues. Um, I've included here on the right a bit of a, a visual of what we have displayed in our uh, MR facilities for uh, response to code blue. So there's an associated document for training, and this is what is visually displayed in our uh, MR systems areas. Some technical considerations, I've just put a, a bunch of illustrations here on the, on the page, and, and they'll matter uh, differently for different people. Uh, but they should all be considered. So, uh, you know, making sure that you're operating, that, that you know what to do to operate at the right field strength uh, and any technical specificities to your MRI system, making sure that the accessories with which you operate in that suite are appropriate. Um, familiarize yourself and even implement a four zone system uh, as recommended by a few different uh, international guidelines. If your facility uh, is not really compatible with a four, four zone system, do your best to ensure that people know how they are navigating around the facility and what risk areas may exist. Um, particularly germane to cardiac examinations are patient monitoring systems. Make sure that you operate with MR conditional uh, devices, and that you are ready with the correct equipment for any medical emergencies. Note that most crash carts, therefore, uh, are, are not uh, MR safe or are MR unsafe. Um, I'm taking a moment here to note sort of the, the importance of, uh, of, of considerations around MR field strength. Uh, and system design. I've plotted here sort of along this list or, or along this right to left axis or left to right axis systems that operate at very low field strengths on the left and much higher field strengths on the right. Of course, clinical MRI systems that are probably most common these days operate somewhere in the range that I've highlighted in the middle of this plot. Um, there is a propensity in the MR safety literature to focus on 1.5 and three Tesla systems. And unfortunately, over the years, there has been a lot of, uh, there has not been a lot of attention paid to MR safety uh, at the lower field strengths, particularly with respect to uh, clearing of implants at these uh, lower field strengths. 
That is changing with the return of lower field strength systems um, or sort of a re-expansion of lower field strength practice um, in the sort of lower Tesla range. The advent of these portable ultra low field MRI systems really changes the game in terms of MR uh, safety. It's a completely different uh, way of thinking about it and clearing of implants, for example, becomes quite, uh, quite different. So what are some exam related considerations? These are the kinds of things that you can ask yourself quickly on a day-to-day -day basis when uh, producing uh, an examination. Um, make sure that you know what your exam objectives are, what you are headed for, uh, and whether there's any use of fast sequences and the likelihood of uh, peripheral nerve stimulation, high power RF sequences, the use of gadolinium-based contrast agent, which is common in cardiac MRI, is important to consider in terms of uh, patient safety, put the potential for adverse reactions. Um, and last but not least, of course, are any specific procedures for cardiac imaging, stressor agents, any kind of particular procedures that are used to examine uh, the cardiac muscle or the, the cardiovascular system. Um, it's important to make sure that those procedures are well, well established and well followed and that you have, of course, uh, medical emergency procedures with respect to adverse uh, drug reactions and other health conditions. And speaking of health conditions, of course, your patient uh, should be a central consideration. Um, a central consideration to planning your examination, uh, knowing about any medical or health conditions, even mental health conditions, uh, the ability to comply with instructions, so knowing that your patient will be able to complete the examination and do so safely. And of course, a lot of concern around devices and uh, implants. I see that there are a couple of questions that have popped up already. I will read them off because they are being they are uh, becoming relevant to the presentation content as we move forward. First question is uh, whether there are um, whether there are pacemakers that are safe for three T and whether there's pacemaker safety around three uh, T. And um, the uh, second question that has been listed already is whether it is considered safe to have an MRI scan after implant surgery. Now, both of those questions I've actually uh, I have answers for in the, the, the next few slides. So we will uh, get to those points. I see a longer question that's just come up and we will uh, deal with that in a moment. So some potentially sensitive patients uh, are listed here. I won't go through the entire list. In fact, this is just taken from a Philips uh, scanner manual. Your scanner manual should have such a list. If it does not, it would be important to come up with something institutionally so that you uh, that you know um, which patients require special uh, attention around MR practice. And so we're going to move into discussing very briefly the idea around patient devices or, or concepts around patient devices and implants. And that'll give me a chance to answer some of the specific questions uh, that'll come up in the chat, that have come up in the chat. So let me note to start that all devices and implants are relevant. So they at least require a moment's attention, if not more work to uh, move ahead. There is no substitute for preventative thinking. So the idea that you know, you can go through lists and lists of categories of implants and making sure that when you come up on one uh, institutionally, you know what to do. And I've listed or I've illustrated here um, using some specific examples, various categories of implants uh, from um, on the left here, the kind that are removable. So the kinds of uh, devices that patients may come around with and could perfectly be uh, removed and allow the patient to go through safely with their MR examination. They still need to be screened for and identified. Uh, and then we have implants uh, of the kind that are passive. So implants that do not require any power to perform their function. There's a whole variety of these, many of which, for example, as pictured here are uh, orthopedic in nature. They of course have to be uh, given due consideration. 
And last but not least on the right here, devices that are active and that may have an internal or implanted or or uh, on planted component, as well as an external or not implanted uh, component. So it's important to, to give broad consideration to all of these and to establish practices around all of them. Um, I see, I'm just going to read off a question here uh, quietly and make sure that as I go along, I address the points in here. Uh, there's an excellent point here that's sort of made as as a comment and then sort of uh, uh, ask, there's a big ask in there at the end. And I, I think it's worth addressing this now and then uh, I'll carry on into the presentation. So I'll read this off. The, the speaker says that, that they've scanned a patient with a pacemaker recently. It was prescribed uh, safe, uh, but in a 1.5 T system. So uh, the, the device had conditions that made it appropriate for imaging at 1.5 Tesla system. Uh, it's also observed that a lot of uh, people or patients come in with implants, but have no idea how to document or uh, prove their MR safety conditions. And so the the, the operator, the MR operator, the, te the technologist, radiographer, uh, welcoming these patients and proceeding with the exam um, often have to make calls, whether that's literal phone calls <laughs> to find out more information or calls as in decisions uh, whether or not to move ahead and then get information from device manufacturers um, is, is quite important and common. There, uh, there goes on with a comment here to say this is rampant in developing countries. Uh, I'm going to reassure you that this is also rampant in what we might call or consider <laughs> developed countries. Uh, patients, just as many patients come in without complete information or with partial recollection of what they might have. We are asking for information across hospital systems. We are consulting with physicians who have seen these patients beforehand, consulting OR reports to, to generate uh, confirmable information. So this is common practice indeed. Um, and then there's, a, there's an ask in there to say, it'd be great to start a conversation, educate clinicians and surgeons um, a lot more to provide documented information on patient implants or to patients on implants. And I wholeheartedly, 100% fully agree on this as a practicing medical physicist in a hospital who's often called upon to provide recommendations and information about specific implants. Uh, yes, uh, informing and, and educating physicians on their responsibilities to provide information to their patients when they walk out of a procedure with an implant so that they can walk, they can go forward in their lives and confidentially provide that information subsequently to MR examinations is incredibly important. Um, and if you as an MR practitioner can provide some information to patients that are walking away from your facility as sort of patchwork, that will help. Uh, but of course, there needs to be an educational uh, component at the physician level. And so that's uh, hugely important. It's something that we try and do here locally in Montreal, across uh, Quebec and across Canada, but it is a bit of an uphill battle. So I, I empathize with that comment. So get off my sort of small soapbox here uh, and come back to the material um, in the in the presentation <clears throat> and then speak uh, briefly about the risks related to device safety. Of course, these arise from the same uh, interactions that we've already described with the various MR system components. Uh, I've been sort of repeating this a little bit um, uh, throughout the presentation, but of course it's important to pay attention to ferromagnetic content of these implants, knowing which implants are ferromagnetic and which are not based on verifiable information is incredibly important. Uh, the potential for active device disruption, I also highlight here. And um, perhaps quite uh, reasonably relevant to cardiac uh, examinations, insofar as they involve typically patients who have health conditions related to their cardiovascular system. 
and therefore may have leads in their bodies. So there is always the theoretical risk of induced currents in these leads. Um, and it's important to note that the uh, uh, practices around uh, device safety really also depend on the device configuration, where it is in the body, what role it's playing, and its location relative to the examination. So uh, there may be uh, important points to consider whenever you're preparing for a specific exam. It is difficult for me to give you blank guidance or uh, uh, sort of yes, no, black and white kinds of answers on most implants, unfortunately. A lot of it is case by case basis. So I repeat that all devices are relevant implant or not, and they have varying degrees. I will get to some specifics on that in a moment. Um, of course, workflow is important. So knowing who practices the initial screening, how and why, what information they're collecting, how useful that information is, is key to establishing safe imaging conditions. And it should be performed by trained personnel. Once that information is on is at hand, there should be a clear risk benefit analysis. That risk benefit analysis may take a second. You may find negligible risk and absolute benefit to the patient and move on. Of course, it's important to do no harm and if necessary to defer examinations at the other uh, end. Um, any devices where there's doubt uh, or questions around whether they should safely go into the MRI system, of course, require in investigation and clearance uh, with appropriate resources. And I'll come to a point where I'm specific about appropriate resources. Uh, in your workflow, there should be secondary and even tertiary screening. So in our in our institution, that that means write, written screening at the time of requisition. So that happens at the same time as the MR scan is requested. A second written screening happens on the day of the examination with the radiographer technologist and a verbal screening before entering the MR exam room. The time period between the first and second written screening is usually at least a few days, if not a few weeks or months, depending on wait lists. And that is the perfect time to produce uh to, to perform any clearing tasks and i'll remind you that any and all of these decisions you make and as uh, technologist radiographers are under physic physician supervision whether direct or indirect so never hesitate to consult uh, with physicians when making decisions about allowing patients to go into the mr environment See an important comment here on the left, uh, uh, or a couple of questions, it, it, whether there's a um, physician MR safety awareness, whether there's something that could be done as part of MR safety week. So I think that may be referring to MR safety week that's been publicized on social media for the last few years. Uh, it's led by efforts um, in, mostly in the US, but it's become kind of uh, communicated everywhere. Um, of course, there's efforts done in that area, but I also think there, there's a need for efforts done uh, very much at the local level. Uh, and then there's some comments about statistics annually in the US, and this is probably reflected in many uh, um, countries where MR practice is common, um, about damage to, audit to the auditory system, so to patient hearing because of uh, an absence of good protective or even no, none, no protection uh, at all. Um, and indeed, um, it's about building a culture of, of safe examinations and causing no harm to patients during uh, these exams. And it, in fact, it, it isn't uh, a matter of, of, of the kind of country where you come from. It's a matter of MR safety, independently of where you practice that. Physics doesn't change depending on where, physics and biology don't change depending on where you are uh, living. So when it comes to clearing implants, and we're gonna get back to our, our uh, content at hand here, I think the comments uh, along the way, I've, I've, I feel they bring a, a nice conversation. Getting back to our implants, I wanna point out that there's a, 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 
sort of echoes of old terminology that you'll find in device and implant labeling, which is um, uh, the use of the terms MR safe and MR compatible. So MR safe remains a term in use, and we'll discuss that in a moment. It used to mean safe under known conditions, which is what we today refer to as MR conditional. And MR compatible meant safe under known conditions and causing negligible artifact. Updated terminology from the ASTM organization, which is an internationally recognized organization at this point, prescribes three levels of labeling, which some country-wide regulations adhere to, many countries adhere to this and impose it on device manufacturers. And this is the use of a three-tiered terminology, which you're probably already familiar with, which is, includes MR safe, which means MR safe in any MR environment. This usually means non-metallic and non-conductive. MR conditional, so conditions need to be specified and then unsafe in any MR environment. So what are some resources you can use to clearing uh, for clearing of devices? And on the left here is the challenge of positively identifying the device, so device identification. And on the left is finding the right information to match with that identification information. So some patients will come with patient device cards. That's great. If they walk in with the right uh, information, great. Then begins the research. Things like health records and patients' medical history, which can be a real challenge and sometimes it requires time, it requires patient consent. It can be a real slog to do this, I agree. And so building up an experience to do this is crucially important. Uh, prior imaging, if available, can be consulted, uh, can be shown to physicians to help make uh, the clinical decision to go ahead with imaging. Uh, new imaging can be acquired, so radiographic when the resources are available, of course. <clears throat> there is a, a commercial aspect that is growing in this area. There's a market now for ferromagnetic medical detector, or metal detectors, uh, which help detect the presence of ferromagnetic implants, ferromagnetic devices uh, on or in your patient. Um, there is a bit of a split opinion on the use of regular medical uh, or metal detectors around patients because they will pick up both ferromagnetic and non-ferromagnetic metal and maybe uh, don't help with making specific decisions. Once a device has been positively identified, um, then one can rely on institutional policy. If there's been an informed policy made within the institution, great. Otherwise, there can be vendor device information available on the web. Uh, web resources that are not vendor specific, so there are websites out there, some free, some for pay, that will uh, provide the information. And then there is MR vendor software uh, as well that is available to help make decisions about safe or safe imaging in the presence of devices and implants. <clears throat> what to do in absences of exact information, one then needs to make an informed decision based on the available knowledge and a risk versus benefit analysis. And without physician input on this, there is no risk benefit analysis. It is important to consult with physicians who make the ultimate decisions on this. There was a question earlier on about delays post implantation. And so here we are. Uh, the understanding is that the delays that are often thought about um, allow for a healing process and device anchoring. And so many centers have an, a six week or N week rule. Uh, six is what's common around where I work. Uh, and there will be no MR imaging after six weeks or, or within six weeks of implantation for any device. This is conservative and, in fact, may be overzealous. There's increasing evidence for many implants that imaging can be performed, sometimes as soon as immediately post-implant. What's important to consider is which implant it is and whether or not it matters to have this extra device anchoring. Unfortunately, there is contradictory, sometimes spotty information circulating on this topic. So it's best to look at this on a case-by-case -case basis to have an across-the-board rule 
is not wrong, but it will delay some examinations in certain patients unnecessarily. For non-ferromagnetic devices, there is no need to wait. The device will not move in the RF field uh, and therefore, or not in the RF field, in the main magnetic field, and therefore is going to be a non-issue. For well-anchored devices, even those that are weakly ferromagnetic, I'm thinking of orthopedic implants that are drilled in, directly into bone, there is also no need to wait. Some of these devices can even be implanted under MR guidance. For certain devices, it may be best to wait unless it's urgent. So an example might be a pacemaker. And there, it's not because the pacemaker will move, but it's to avoid any potential inf interference with pacemaker functionality within the first few weeks of the patient carrying that device with them. So quite a, 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 an important distinction to be made. So there's a risk benefit evaluation uh, uh, to be made in cases where there may be a risk um, and uh, the clear immediate benefit may even outweigh that risk if it's a, if it's a, a we need a, a quick decision based on the diagnostic information. So always, always, always a physician clinical decision. A word about patients with multiple devices. Uh, there is a theoretical and sometimes practical concern for interaction effects that may introduce extra risk. Um, some device manufacturers, select device manufacturers, even have restrictive labeling. They'll say no scanning with multiple devices in the presence of our device. I'm thinking of a particular device manufacturer for pacemakers. In fact, this is most relevant for multiple devices that are implanted in cardiac tissue. So a, a non-relevant case might be a patient who has a cardiac stent and a hip replacement. Uh, there is essentially no potential for interaction. Both devices are MR conditional at best or at most, and therefore the patient can still be imaged. There could be uh, some concern around uh, devices that are directly implanted uh, into cardiac tissue. For example, uh, retained leads and any new device implanted in there. This is in fact for cardiac devices addressed in the literature in a recent guidance document uh, from the UK. So turning uh, as, we, as we move towards the finish line to cardiovascular devices. This slide shows an array of illustrations, pictures, radiographs of the variety of devices that patients who suffer from cardiovascular disease or have a cardiovascular health condition may or may not have with them, or we may use to monitor their health status. I will not go through the entire list on a case-by-case -case basis. You will recognize some of these devices. Others will seem uh, perhaps a little less um, familiar to you, but I do want to post this table here where I've sorted the devices that were pictured on the previous slide into three broad categories categories of least or lowest concern, moderate concern, and highest concern. And I've sorted them on the basis that those of lowest concern, which include, for example, cardiovascular stents or cardiac closures, post-surgical cardiac closures, IVC filters. Uh, these are devices where with positive identification of the, of the device, you should be in a position to clear most of them for exam MR examination. There are legacy devices still floating around that need to be positively identified and may rule out the patient from specific kinds of exams, exposure to high magnetic fields, et cetera. But this is an area where the, the practice should be relatively straightforward. In the middle column, we have the uh, devices of moderate concern. I've introduced here other stents because stents are often described as just stents, not necessarily cardiovascular stents. Other stents are likely to require a bit more information and specific information for clearing. Uh, implantable loop recorders are on here, not because they're unsafe, but because there does need to be an intervention to download their data before exposing them to the MR environment. Uh, they are usually perfectly fine to go into the MR environment. Uh, hemodynamic monitoring devices of the external kind, those that are not implanted in any way, 
if they can be removed or uh, or traded in for an MR conditional device uh, are going to be perfectly compatible with uh, MR examination. And I've put epicardial retained leads in this area. Uh, I have some comments on epicardial retained leads on another slide, so we'll come back to those. And in the third column here, I've included the devices that are of highest concern. So these are the ones that uh, will either require special procedures or expertise to expose to the MR environment, and you'll recognize some of the devices on this list, uh, or may lead to outright contraindications. I will comment on cardiac implanted electronic devices of the permanent kind in a moment, as well as the leads. I see we have a comment here on the, on the left, which I'll have a look at quickly. Uh, um, intervention says uh, that they had a request once for a cardiac exam to the patient that was in the ICU, was an oncologic patient suspicious, so with a, sus a suspected myocarditis. It bilateral drain catheters in each lung, and the condition didn't let him uh, come for the exam. In this case, would it be better to wait until the catheters are placed, are, are removed from the body, or in which cases we can proceed with implants? So with drain catheters, uh, it would entirely depend on the type that are used. If the device is all plastic, um, then there is no issue with going into the MRI. If the device is all plastic but requires some kind of ferromagnetic or, or metallic support device, then it would be good to have MR conditional support devices, whether that's an IV pole uh, or, or substitute. The specific catheters that may have metallic components to them should be positively identified. We should know exactly what type it is and manufacturer information should be consulted before even deciding on whether or not to go ahead with the examination. Um, I also work in an oncology environment and many of our patients come with either drains or uh, drips and, and we can clear very we can clear most of them, if not all of them, for M MR examination on the basis of knowing what device is being used. Uh, quite often, if it's a device from your own hospital, it'll be quite straightforward to consult exactly what is used and um, and, and then to go ahead with MR uh, examination. In some cases, there can be complications because the device is not MR uh, conditional, it's MR unsafe. And that may require a decision on the physician's part to either delay the MR examination, which in the case here of suspected myocarditis, it's, uh, it's not a great uh, option, or to remove uh, the medical device that is in use on that patient. And so there can be uh, some really difficult decisions to make there, and they have to be made, uh, um, you know, in concert with the with the care team. Uh, th these are not to be made uh, by uh, single individuals, of course. So, in the last um, couple of minutes, some comments on a few of the implant categories that we've talked about. So, cardiac implanted or implantable electronic devices. These include uh, ICDs and pacemakers. It's a traditional contraindication. It used to be that an MR, there was no examination in the presence of these devices, but there's an increasingly, or an increasing use of MR conditional CIEDs. Um, in order to safely examine these, there has to be a well-established strong collaboration between radiology and cardiology in your institution. In the absence of this collaboration, or even in the absence of cardiology services, there should not be a go ahead to examine patients with cardiac implanted devices at this time. Now, practice may evolve in the future, but we are still at that stage, even in the most advanced centers. There is available guidance from various organizations, and I have some references a little later on, that provides clear workflows. It usually involves interrogation of the device, a very specific procedure during the MR examination and post-exam interrogation of the device, all very important. Some comments on uh, hybrid conditional devices recently published. There's a reference at the bottom of this page here. And there's growing evidence, and this may come in, in the sort of mid-term mid future, that MR conditional, non-MR conditional devices, so devices that were traditionally considered unsafe for MR examination, that may be becoming... 
uh, okay for MR examination. There's a reference here at the bottom uh, of the slide as well. A comment on retained leads, of course, patients with cardiovascular conditions are likely or are more likely than the average people to have retained leads. In short, epicardial leads pose a low risk when it comes to MR examination. Uh, patients with retained transvenous leads pose a more significant risk of heating and or thermal injury. And so centers examining these patients should have expertise in MR and cardiology. So, so the same level of care that is given to uh, implantable devices. And last but not least, fractured leads are and remain a contraindication for uh, MR examination. And there's a link at the bottom here explaining more of these details. I see we're right uh, on time. In fact, about a minute over. Here are some uh, references for guidance and procedures. Uh, at the top, basic safety practice uh, from various sources in North America, in the UK, and in uh, Australasia. Uh, guidance on how to proceed around cardiac implantable electronic devices are linked there from the same three countries. There may be other sources, of course, but these are uh, of various sources. So in conclusion, make sure that there's a strong foundation of MR safety uh, in your institution. Establish and document the policies and procedures. And if you're working at the radiography uh, or the radiographer technologist uh, level, push for it, uh, make sure that it does get developed, that there are clear roles, communication, and decision-making around these practices. Make sure that there are good medical intervention protocols around the various examinations and practice good device safety. I believe that is what I had indeed. And so we are on time. I am in no rush to go away. I am happy to take questions I've answered and addressed the comments and questions that came up in the chat. Uh, so far, I am happy to stick around for a few more questions for those of you who have them and wish to stick around. Thank you very much for that very insightful talk. I think it was uh, maybe quite a bit of uh, new information for everyone, even if there was, they're already acquainted with working with MRs. But yeah, if anyone has questions, then either feel free to write them into the chat or to raise your hand. And then you can unmute yourself. If not, Hello. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, someone has a question. Hi, okay, my name is George, okay. Uh, I remember doing the presentation, you made a statement that if, let's say, Orthopedic implant, implants, implants that are screwed to the bone, that is fitting to a bone or a structure. It's, uh, it's, you can go ahead and do the MRI for the patients. For example, if a patient has a, maybe a screw, plate screw in the, in the leg, they are going to do a brain MRI. Automatically, the area of interest is in the middle of the magnet and the feet are out of, the, out of the magnet. Is it still important to consider whether the plating is MRI compatible or not? That's a great question. That's a great question. When it comes to uh, orthopedic implants, uh, and I'm speaking from a, from a North American centric position here, so I want to be careful. Uh, there has largely been a transition to non-ferromagnetic or weakly ferromagnetic materials used in, in these implants, okay? Are there legacy devices that are more strongly ferromagnetic out there? It's possible. That said, the reality of orthopedic implants is that they have to be securely attached in order to perform their function, whether it is a hip implant, a screw to repair a, a fracture, even dental implants, 
plates to replace uh, surgical cavities uh, on the skull. These, these devices need to be strongly anchored in place to function. Otherwise, they're not doing their, their job. The forces used to attach these to bone are very high. In fact, they're much greater than any gravitational force applied on that device, right? So if I have a hip implant, the force holding it into my body is much greater than the gravitational force pulling it down to the floor. So why am I bringing the gravitational force into this? Well, the gravitational force is the force that we use as a comparison reference in safety testing for implants. And when I say we, I mean the community. So safety testing labs following testing standards compare the magnetic force pulling the implant towards the center of the bore and the gravitational force pulling the implant down. And as long as the gravitational force is stronger than the magnetic force, usually that means that the, for, the those magnetic forces are negligible. And the device can often then be qualified as MR conditioned. Okay, if not, in some parlances, MR safe. So now making the connection between the orthopedic implant that's so strongly implanted into the body that's attached to a rigid structure in the body, being much stronger in force, right, than any gravitational pull, and therefore much stronger in force than any magnetic pull, most of these inter these, these orthopedic devices are okay for MR imaging. They are conditional or MR safe for, for imaging. Now, there are a couple of exceptions and, and, and sort of two things that relate to your question. One, uh, there are certain devices that are quite long. Now they're rare. Um, the, the Maybe the most commonly stated one in MR safety literature are called Harrington rods. If I can write it down here, Harrington, right? Harrington rods, are long rods with screw attachments that are placed on the spine, typically to, to correct for scoliosis. And because they are long, they may not be ferromagnetic, they may not be projectile risk devices, but they may result in conduction of electrical currents and may be at higher risk to heating, okay? Now, there is, pretty good anecdotal evidence that this is typically a negligible risk, but you will want to have an institutional policy to decide whether or not such long devices should be acceptable for MR examination from a radio frequency heating safety perspective. Okay, so long orthopedic devices are worth consideration. Hip implants are typically not long enough for this consideration. Okay, they would have to be sort of full bone length or, or, or spine length. There are some typical lengths that are, are stated out there in, in the guidelines, and those lengths actually depend on, on the field strength at which you're operating. The higher the field strength, the shorter the maximum length for safe MR practice, if you want. So at lower field strengths, you can accommodate longer and longer implants. Now, you also did mention whether or not the implant, orthopedic in this case, is at the center, even in the imaging field of view. Now, whether it's in the imaging field of view or not actually matters from a radio frequency perspective. So if I'm imaging the brain and the device is at the leg, the potential for RF heating is much lower than if the device is at the leg and I'm imaging the leg, right? Because the exposure to radio frequency fields varies depending on the placement of the object within the field. So from a radio frequency perspective, that does matter. In addition, and less of a safety concern, but an imaging quality perspective is whether or not the device being in place is going to affect the overall image quality. And if it does have a, a completely damaging effect on device or on imaging quality, then the benefit of the exam is actually reduced. So one needs to keep that in mind is whether or not the image quality is going to be maintained in the presence of that implant. Now, ferromagnetic implants are going to generate much larger artifacts than non-ferromagnetic implants. And going back to my earlier statement, 
that there has been an increasingly large use of non-ferromagnetic materials in orthopedic implants. The, the risk of large art artifacts is much reduced. In other words, the artifacts have become smaller over time. Is that, I, there's a lot of content, but I hope it addresses the question uh, in general. There's another right. question in the chat. In the uh, chat, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So let me uh, read off the next question here. How do you handle implant whose implant, how, how do you handle a patient, not an implant, how do you handle a patient whose implant you cannot tell the type and the patient has no information at all about implant type? So the extreme case where this happens is patients who have cognitive deficits, who have no memory, are are, uh, are are senior enough that they are they've forgotten the device was put in so long ago they have no idea what it was right in those cases one needs to uh have someone accompany the patient someone from their family who may be able to provide additional information right especially in cases where there's cognitive deficit in cases where the information is so old that the patient doesn't recall well they're their children or accompanying uh, younger adults or whatnot may not remember either. <laughs> so um, in those cases, it can be difficult. This is why I mentioned things like written medical history, consulting medical history, if available. I realize that this is not always available. You know, patients who may have never been to a hospital before are much harder <laughs> to pin down than patients who have had a history of consultation. Um, when it comes to, I, then if you're in absence of information, whether, whether it's prior, uh, yeah, exactly. I see your comment here. Difficult to get such records, of course. And in fact, in North America, and I, I can only anecdotally imagine in other countries where immigration is, is, uh, a, a growing, um, reality, we have patients who come from elsewhere and therefore do not arrive with medical records either. Uh, it is a challenge. Now, what can we do? Well, to start knowing where the implant is, is a great starting point, right? If they can just point to the region of the body to know where the device might be, that is great. All right, that's already a great starting point. If they have no recollection of that, oof, it's going to be quite difficult. Once you know that, radiographic imaging can be quite useful, right? Whether it's uh, planar imaging, projection radiographs, two planes, two, or, uh, two orthogonal planes, uh, at least you'll see if there's something there, and you'll see whether or not it's radio opaque. And if it's radio opaque, then there's a good chance that you'll be able to, to get some idea of the shape, of the length, of what the device might be. In fact, you may also find out whether or not the device is supposed to be there or whether it got in there accidentally, because there are injury-related uh, uh, devices that people carry around with them. Shrapnel, bullets, uh, um, um, industrial accidents, etc. So radiographic imaging will be very useful. If CT is available, that is in principle even better. It gives you three-dimensional imaging with the possibility of also providing the projection planar imaging, right? And if one can get some kind of identification or identifiable, identifiable information about the device from radiographic imaging or, and or CT, that is already a great start. Once you have that information, you still may not have 100% confidence that the examination is going to be safe. Okay, you it, you might see that it's just it's a screw from an orthopedic procedure, or it might have sort of a strange shape and be unidentifiable. Well, of course, um, then what one needs to do is consult with uh, uh, the physician about the risk benefit analysis and to go looking for outside sources. It may be that you have to communicate on sort of international discussion boards using unidentifiable information, you know, screenshots of there's a uh, there's a MR safety Facebook group that exists. There are other discussion, uh, other uh, discussion groups that exist that can help 
dig down for information. It's not always easy, but it is, there are resources out there. Ultimately, there will need to be a decision as to whether or not you have enough information to confidentially establish risk and the physician will be able to balance that against the medical clinical need of the MR examination, right? So where the implant is, what shape it might have in order to be able to identify it, and from there, a risk-benefit analysis. Um, adding to this as well, I heard of a case where a person wasn't even aware that there was an implant. So oh. they had brain surgery years ago, and there was some bleeding, so there was a metallic implant inserted, but I think the person wasn't even notified of it. So right. how how often is it to check? Uh, how common is it to check if there's something when the patient itself doesn't know? Great, 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 great question. Great comment. This uh, actually appears in level two sort of MRI safety training whenever bringing personnel up to speed on screening. We've talked about implant and, and device safety today, but we didn't go through in detail what the screening process might look like. Well, the screening process should include questions about prior medical interventions. Have you had brain surgery? Have you had any cardiac surgery? Have you had any other kind of surgery? Also questions about accidents. Have you been, have you had a workplace injury? Have you been involved in a car accident or have you been in a war zone? Things of the kind. Now that needs to be adapted to the context. And you know, you may not want a list of 25 different questions about these kinds of life events, but some basic number of fundamental life event related questions are important because what they then trigger is asking further questions of the patient or of the patient's medical record or triggering even radiographic imaging to screen for specific suspected devices. So a patient who describes having had brain surgery, well, if they've had brain surgery, chances are something was left in there, either some kind of a plate or a clip or a surgical clip or an aneurysm clip or an embolization coil, there may be something in there. And it is important to know that. So in the, in sort of, in the, in the sort of, yes, I've had uh, um, brain surgery. No, I don't know if they left anything in there. To me, that's an indication to go to radiographic imaging and identify the presence of, of radio opaque uh, items in the brain. Mm -hmm. Cardiac surgery or cardiovascular interventions trigger Inter, trigger uh, uh, research into any potentially related devices, injuries when it comes to uh, car accidents or workplace injury, et cetera, then trigger questions about, did you have an intervention? Did you have to have surgery following that? Where in your body? Is it possible that something was left behind? So those questions, they do need to be asked during screening. Yeah. So asking questions about life events during screening often is what triggers the subsequent questions about potential implants. So maybe yeah. rather than a um, checklist, it should be some kind of flow chart of which questions to ask. To not ask. That's all. an interesting comment. Mm. Yeah, that that's an interesting comment. Uh, uh, our institution has kept a checklist approach and the, the check approach has the life event questions at the top mm -hmm. so that the life event questions flag the, the person who is asking the questions. Because one thing I didn't mention, I suppose, is the, the questionnaire ideally is completed in the presence of trained personnel, or in fact, the trained personnel is asking the questions. Mm -hmm. the, the life event questions coming first put the trained personnel on alert that they should pay attention to the subsequent questions that come in the list. Mm -hmm. um, flow chart type approaches are, are an interesting suggestion. I have personally not observed them. I'd be a little careful of, of then not following down the right arm of the flow chart, but mm -hmm. 
you know, it, it certainly could be constructed in a way that it is, uh, that it is useful. Yeah. But life event questions are important, of course. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> And one more question. How often are routine checks of the MR machine done normally to see that there are no damages or do these show up in this? Ah, <laughs> excellent question. Excellent question. So now we're delving into another aspect of my, my work, which is quality assurance, right? Making sure that the MR system is functioning appropriately. Um, recommendations are in let's say American guidance, which we tend to follow in Canada, which is freely available is, you know, you can download the PDFs for this and check against your institution's practices. The recommendations and, you know, as I say this, keep in mind that they are uh, developed within an American, a US context, right? The US healthcare system, the US insurance, healthcare insurance system, the the, the practices of American hospitals and American accreditation bodies. Some of this may be a bit overkill, but nonetheless, it's something to shoot for. Mm -hmm. Recommendations are that there should be a daily walk around the system before starting and ensuring that all systems are working well, there are no leaks, no strange noises, no alarms, etc. that there is no da physical damage to the system, that the patient support, the patient monitoring devices, if they're going to be used that day, they should all be checked in the morning, right? You could call that sort of a warm up. So our institution has a daily warm up with a checklist that is performed by the technologist radiographer. Okay. Then uh, there should be sort of a, depending on, on which guidance you follow, weekly or monthly check of image quality, right? Mm -hmm. Typically, it could be performed by the technologist based on a set of instructions, or if a physicist or engineer is available, it could also be performed by that uh, person. And there should be a standardized list of tests that would ensure that the, the MR system is working well on a continuing basis. Okay. During that check, you can also do the walk around and make sure that all the devices are where they should be and working well. But if you're doing that daily anyway, you're fine. Beyond that, the in-depth image quality checks, so it's a more extensive set of tests, the recommendation is annual. And that includes checking all core performance. Uh, it's a more extensive list of imaging tests. It's also uh, the time to do an audit of safety practices, and that should be done uh, on an annual basis. That, that's the recommendation. The, rec the North American recommendation is to have that done by um, a, a physicist. MR physicist or or appropriately chained uh, uh, yeah, MR physicist. The um, additional component to this, and that can depend on the institutional practices and uh, finances, is for the MR vendor or a contractor to come in on a semi-regular basis to check the system also. It's called preventative maintenance, right? Um, this can be done on a on a pay-per-use basis, on a fee-wide basis, or it can be done on a contractual basis. So the vendor or the third-party contractor can be just contracted, and they will come a certain number of times per year to ensure the MR system is working according to their specifications. In our institution, this means twice a year, and we, we pay for that service. Um, what that does is it what that also usually is attached to is some amount of um of, of maintenance service contract so that you know some availability of maintenance services all the way up to full service contracts that take care of absolutely everything around the mri system so in summary a very quick daily daily basic system check a few minutes making sure everything's in good working order and flagging issues Weekly or monthly image quality checks using a short, efficient set of tests, um, and then annual in-depth image quality testing by uh, physicists, um, as well as preventative maintenance uh, on a semi-regular basis somewhere around uh, once to twice a year, uh, if at all possible. Okay. 
So this could be one of the areas where there might be a distinction in MR safety between different countries, right? Uh, are you still are you still talking about the image quality aspect, quality control aspect, or now going back to the MR safety question? No, the okay. how often checks are made. Maybe this differs a bit. Ah, yeah, um, yeah. So the the thing with MR magnetic resonance in comparison to other imaging modalities, ionizing radiation producing imaging modalities, mm -hmm. radi radiography, fluoroscopy, mammography, CT is that in the absence of ionizing radiation, there's a certain laissez-faire attitude when it comes to uh, safety and quality assurance, mm -hmm. which has meant that there have been incidents. I mean, ionizing radiation safety just goes back farther because the incidents happened, <laughs> in essence, longer ago in history that now there is regulation at the governmental level that that says that this is how you shall practice with ionizing radiation, regular system checks, et cetera. Now that of course depends on jurisdiction. Every country will establish its ionizing radiation safety standards. Um, when it comes to MR, it's not as clear cut. Depending on the country, there may or may not be specific laws, even rules or even guidance with respect to MR safety practices. In my own jurisdiction of Canada, the rules, the government laws apply to the electrical safety of the device, which are imposed at import because MR systems are generally not constructed in Canada. We import them from other countries because it's a an imported medical device. It needs to pass a certain number of tests, checks. The certification then comes from the vendor who who then applies for a license to sell these devices in Canada. In other countries where they do produce these devices, the rules may be a little bit different. So there is a safety check at that point, but that is the design of the device. Then subsequent operation, safe operation of the device is also subject to certain rules, right? In other words, the, the, the device manufacturer doesn't just certify the device that works well on the day of, but that with regular preventative maintenance, it will continue to function properly in the long run. That's where the importance of preventative maintenance comes in. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to personnel practicing good MR safety, we largely rely on guidance, guidelines, right? This is experts from the field, from academic radiology, from clinical radiology, who get together, look at the overall data and say, this is how we should do things. That's why it comes from places like the American College of Radiology, the Royal College in Australia, in New Zealand. Um, in the UK, it's the Medical Health Regulation Agency. Uh, it, it really depends then on practitioners to almost self-correct, right? And then every country that has an organization at the radiographer technologist level, whether it's in Canada, the colleges or orders, in the US, the associations of practitioners in other countries as well, those organizations will typically look to the guidance, adopt the guidance, and prescribe it as a practice for their members. Mm -hmm. So the members, as a part of their certification, right? So in jurisdictions that do have certified oper operators of radiological equipment, they're held to practicing at those guidance under those guidance uh, uh, suggestions or, or recommendations by virtue of being certified practitioners. It's just good professional practice for them. Now, that doesn't have the force of law, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. the, the consequences for poor practice, the consequences for incidents are different than if they were to happen under like a legal framework. Mm -hmm. And there will be significant variations across countries in adherence to this, in uh, the 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 tariffs, so the, the encouragements to follow this guidance, as well as the sticks, which punish those who who do not uh, practice accordingly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there there could be very much jurisdictional uh, variations in this. But as I said earlier, 
the, the physics don't change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Electrical currents will be induced in abandoned transvenous <laughs> cardiac leads, whether you're in one country or another, if it's exposed to the right MR environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so we yeah. need to know and how to practice for that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all the questions that I had. I don't know if anyone wants to ask something else. I'm glad there's there's interest. There's still people sticking around to, to hear the and listen to the questions. Uh, uh, I, I hope this was quite useful um, for you. Ah, here we go. There's a question that's come up in the chat. Ah, so under the condition that devices are, are MR conditional or compatible with MR examination, what would be the maximum time for a cardiac resonance exam? That's a great question. The basic answer to that is it depends on the device and on the patient, right? Because the in, in the, let me sort of find a, a space where I could write here. I don't have any blank slides in here. Um, right. Let's just have this up while I while I speak. So um Typically, what happens for a an MR exam with the CIED place in place is that the patient first goes to cardiology for device interrogation, so to make sure the device can go into MRI. Then they will go into MR, and then they will return to cardiology for the device to be reinterrogated. During that interrogation, the device is going to be placed in a mode that allows for it to be exposed to the MR environment. Uh, in the pacemaker, it could mean uh, inactive or asynchronous or just MR mode. Um, for defibrillator devices, it could mean um, asynchronous mode or entirely turned off. Okay. Now, so depending on the device and the patient's dependence on the device, the duration of time between steps one and three, if you want, right? So the duration of time between cardiology visits is going to depend on the cardiologist. The cardiologist is going to say, it's okay for this patient to remain in this state for N hours, for one hour, six hours, 24 hours, because that has a, a, a bearing on the patient's health. Right. I anecdotally have yet to come across a device that we've scanned that is conditional where cardiology gave us a, a ticking clock where they said you have to be done by a certain amount of time. They have told us that the device will revert back to its normal mode within 24 hours, for example. It does so automatically. So certain devices will do that. So that is. Uh, if you want the cardiology side of the question. On the MR side of the question is whether or not this device can be exposed to SAR or gradients or even B0 for extended periods of time. Once the device has been brought into the B0 field and is stable within a static B0 field, the, the MR conditional devices can withstand that B0 field for extended periods of time. There, they, there is little to no risk of displacement, and the device has been put into a mode where it will not malfunction under exposure to the static field. The effects of SAR and gradients are device disruption. So device disruption, again, if the device has been placed in the appropriate mode, is been greatly if greatly reduced if not eliminated. So again, not real a uh, real strong limit, uh, not a real hard limit on examination. Then I suppose we can hone in on heating from RF fields, SAR. And in this case, the effect on the device, the potential for heating doesn't technically increase with scan time. It increases with RF power. So here my advice would be to respect the conditions of the vendor. 
And if the conditions of the vendor are such that they allow for two watts per kilogram for 15 minute intervals, for example, that's a very typical condition. Uh, what that means is two watts per kilogram for a given pulse sequence, a stop, two watts per kilogram for another pulse sequence, a stop, and carrying on in this way. Some manufacturers may say two watts per kilogram, 15 minutes scan time. And there, there's a little bit of confusion in the MR safety community, okay? So when it says two watts per kilogram for 15 minutes, some interpret this as total exam duration, 15 minutes. Seems a bit of a stretch. Most MR examinations are much longer than 15 minutes. Others interpret this as two watts per kilogram for each individual pulse sequence, no more than 15 minutes long. Now you're gonna tell me, well, 15 minute pulse sequence is quite long, right? Especially in the cardiac realm where we're asking for things like uh, stress tests or breathing manipulations or quiet breathing or even breath hold scanning, right? So the 15 minute mark per sequence is another interpretation which as I sort of anecdotally comment, is unlikely to be reached. So in our institution, we tend to interpret this as 15 minutes per series, per pulse sequence, so that we then take pauses between the pulse sequences. We stay within the normal rope, say normal mode limit of two watts per kilogram. If the device says 1.5 watts per kilogram, well, we follow that, okay? And then that, that way we don't result, we, we avoid excessive RF heating. So it's not an absolute duration, it's cardiology considerations and MR safety considerations based on the device. All right, um, any specific ear protection in regard to acoustic MRI uh, or, or to, to a specific MR environment? Uh, let's go back to, I think I had a slide on this some time ago. Hearing protection, I don't know if I recall putting down a number, but I do recall putting down, uh, ah, here we go. So let me get rid of these markings. Um, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, um, the reduction in hearing protection uh, should be at least minus 30 dB, right? So most of these earplugs come with a rating, minus 30 dB, minus 32 dB would be sufficient hearing protection. At our institution, our patients get hearing protection in the form of earplugs and earmuffs, double hearing protection. I see there, same comment from uh, one of our attendees, disposable earplugs and headset. It limits effective interaction with the patient. Indeed, it can. So if, you're, if your communication system doesn't use the, ear, the earmuffs, then that's a problem. All right. Okay. Yes, yeah, so if there are no more questions, maybe... We can we'll call it there. Yes, we can call it there. Uh, thank right. you very much for this very informative session. We really appreciate it. You're most welcome. Yeah. My thank pleasure. You. <laughs> thank you. I will stop the recording now.